is our last week in Leviticus, uh, so if you're still um, reading with us, we're going to the book of Numbers. And uh, by the way, uh, don't be um, don't be put off by a list of names. And you don't have to, there's no exam, and you don't have to be able to pronounce all the names properly. Uh, and your eye flicks to them quick, quickly, and you get to the end of the list. Okay, I'll just, just put that to you, okay? It's easy, it's easy. Uh, but uh, you'll find some very interesting stories in the book of Numbers. Uh, but this morning and this evening, I'm going to um, take some things from Leviticus. And um, Heather, is that you there? Yes. Uh, Heather is going to read for us a little bit from chapter 23. Can I just say, whenever I was reading through this, David, I struggled. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, These are my appointed feasts, the appointed feasts of the Lord, which you are to proclaim as sacred assemblies. The Sabbath. There are six days when you may work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of rest, a day of sacred assembly. You are not to do any work Wherever you live, it is a Sabbath to the Lord. The Passover and unleavened bread. These are the Lord's appointed feasts, the sacred assemblies you are to proclaim at their appointed times. The Lord's Passover begins at twilight on the 14th day of the first month. On the 15th day of that month, the Lord's Feast of Unleavened Bread begins. For seven days you must eat bread made without yeast. On the first day hold a sacred assembly and do no regular work. For seven days present an offering made to the Lord by fire. And on the seventh day hold a sacred assembly and do no regular work. First fruits. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, When you enter the land I am going to give you, and you reap its harvest, bring to the priest a sheaf of the first grain you harvest. He is to wave the sheaf before the Lord, so it will be accepted on your behalf. The priest is to wave it on the day after the Sabbath. On the day you wave the sheaf, you must sacrifice as a burnt offering to the Lord a lamb, a year old, without defect, together with its grain offering of two tenths of an ephah, of fine flour mixed with oil, an offering made to the Lord by fire, a pleasing aroma and its drink offering of a quarter of a hen of wine. You must not eat any bread or roasted or new grain until the very day you bring this offering to your God. This is to be a lasting ordinance for the generations to come wherever you live. And this is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Heather. And uh, hopefully uh, by the end of the service today, you'll understand a little bit more about what the festivals are about, but we will see. Uh, Boys and girls, we're going to come up to the front, and we're going to have a little story, uh, episode two of our cowboy serial story. Up you come. Who have we got this morning? Good to see you. Oh, here you come. Now. Nikki said to me um, yesterday when we were, um, last Sunday rather, when we went home having, having lunch, uh, she said, uh, you know, those boys and girls won't have a clue what you're talking about because you guys don't watch films about cowboys and Indians, do you? How many of you have ever seen a film about cowboys and Indians? No. You see, if you, <coughs> if you ask your mum or dad, in fact, maybe not your mum or dad, you might need to ask your granny and granda. Um, about cowboys and Indians films, because way back though, that was kind of a, a big thing, whereas these days um, you have stories about other things. But it'll still make some sense to you, I'm sure. 
Okay, so the characters in the story, there was Jim Maida, and he had, um, he had inherited a ranch. It was a bit run down, but uh, he was glad to be a, a cowboy. And when he left school, he came and he got a cowboy outfit. And lawyer Seesom was the guy who was in charge and had introduced... Um, um, Adam to, uh, the, um, to, to, uh, to, the, to the ranch, and he gave them some very good advice. He said, now, I suggest that you hire a very good foreman. And remember, there were two candidates. Uh, one of them was um, Joshua, Joshua Roivas was his name, and uh, he had good references and seemed to work hard, and he had farmer's hands, remember that bit? And uh, he had a big scar on his face, by the way. I'll tell you about that later on some other time. Uh, and then the other guy that he thought uh, he, would, he would hire uh, was um, Snakey Natus. And remember in the story we were, we, were, we were saying last week that in the story the people um, represent different people. So Jim Maida, he was like us. Um, Joshua Roivas, uh, he's, if you turn the words backwards, uh, that means savior. And uh, snaky natus, when you turned the word natus back to front, what did you get the word? What word did you get? S Satan. Yes, that's right. Okay. Now, Jim had decided that he would be sensible. Do, do, you, do you guys ever get up some morning and think, you know, today I'm going to be sensible? No. No. Well, I used to be like that. I wake up and say, I'm going to be sensible. And then something happens and you do something stupid. Well, this is one of those days for Jim because he had decided that Joshua was the most reliable foreman that he could have. So he would invite him to be the foreman. And just then, Snakey Natus, let's go back one picture. Uh, Snakey Natus um, turned up and on his horse, and the horse did, and he dug his spurs in, and the horse did, and he jumped off all in one go, just like that, and he pulled out his gun, and he shot some shots. And just in that moment, stupid Jim changed his mind. And he decided to ask Snakey Natus to be the foreman. So Snakey Natus said, that's cool. And he took his bunk stuff in and he threw it into the, 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 the bunkhouse. And he lay down in his bed and he went. <laughs> and how much hard work do you think he did? None. Quite right. And the next day, how much hard work did he do? None. And after another week or two of this, this was getting kind of, he wasn't doing any work. He was just a lazy old so-and-so. And, and he, 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 he kind of was shooting his guns and, and, and wasting stuff. And, and he didn't do any work on the farm at all. Well, then he had an idea. Let's have the next picture because the next day, um, Jim was in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the store and he met Lawyer Seesom. And he told Lawyer Seesom, uh, well, it's not going all that well. And he said, I've, I've hired Snakey Natus. I did, I did, he said, I, I, did offer, um, uh, I did offer Joshua a, a job as the, as the cow hand, as the, as the junior helper on the farm. But he said, no, he couldn't. He, could, he said he couldn't work with Snakey Natus. Uh, he said, no, that wouldn't work. Um, but he said, Snakey's had a good idea. He's decided that we should go and we should go get some wild horses. Because in the next valley... Uh, there, were, there were wild horses. And Lawyer Seesom said, mm, I don't think that's a good idea. He said, because that valley belongs to the Indians. And that's, that's sacred ground for them. That's special territory. That belongs to them. And the horses there, they belong to the Indians. Well, Jim came back to Snakey and said, um, I don't think we should go and get those. I'm not sure. He said, are you just scared of the Indians? Huh, you're, just, you're just chicken. Now, boys, it's, it's not good. if someone calls you a chicken, what do you do? You're going, I'm going to fight. We don't like being called chicken, do we? No, no, I'm not scared of anything. Well, um, the next day, they got on their horses, and they went, let's have the next picture. They went, into the, they went into the Indians' valley, into their sacred territory. And sure enough, there were about a dozen beautiful-looking wild horses. And Snakey said, they don't belong to anybody. They don't belong to the Indians. They're, they're wild horses. And we, if we can capture them, we can keep them. Do you think that's a good idea? No. no. Well, anyway, they rode on their horses, and they went towards the wild horses. And just then, Jim looked over his shoulder. He said, there's somebody there. And Snakey said, no, there's not. And then he went on a little bit. There's, there's somebody there. 
And then all of a sudden, Snakey just seemed to disappear. And then there was a sudden flash. And everything went, and then everything went black. And Jim fell off his horse. He was knocked out. And if you want to know what happened to Jim, and if the Indians have got him, you have to listen very carefully. Because what happened next was, he woke up. And when Jim woke up, he tried to rub his head because his head was a bit sore. And he couldn't rub his head. Let's have the next picture. Go back one, sorry. I thought there was one of the... No. He, uh, he couldn't rub his head because his hands were tied behind his back. And he was tied to a pole. And then one of the Indians uh, shouted, Oh, look, he's woken up, he's woken up. And they called to our, for uh, Big Chief Sitting Bull. And he came out. And Big Chief Sitting Bull said, And why were you trying to steal our horses from our sacred ground? He said, The penalty for stealing Indian horses is death. And he took ten steps back. And he took out his sharpest tomahawk. And he threw it at Jim. And the tomahawk went... Is that the next picture? And the tomahawk is this far away from Jim's head. And if you want to know what happened next, you will have to come back next Sunday. <laughs> Let's have the next picture. Okay. What's our lesson for today? All right. Sin is something that's serious. Let's have the next click. Come. First of all, do you think it was right or wrong for Jim and Snakey Days to go and steal the Indian's horses? Was that wrong? That was wrong, yes. You know that, don't you? You don't steal something that belongs to somebody else. And if you did, you'd get into trouble. It's a sin, isn't it? And sin is going our own way and not God's way. Sin is also doing the easy thing and not the right thing. The right thing would have been for Snakey Natives and for Jim to work hard on the farm and to raise their own horses, not go and steal the Indian's horses. And last click on this one then says, sin is disobeying God's law. God says certain things are right and certain things are wrong. And if we do the things that God says we shouldn't do, then that's a sin. And if we don't do the good things that God says we should do, well, that's also a sin. And so that's the lesson from our little story. We'll see what happens to Jim, whether he managed to get out of this terrible pickle that he's in. But he shouldn't have done it, and he shouldn't have listened to Snakey Natus, and he shouldn't have gone to steal the Indian's horses, and now he's in big trouble. But hopefully you'll have learnt that little lesson that don't do things that God says you shouldn't do. Let's have the next picture. I think that's the end of the... Is there one more? That's it? Yeah, that's it. Right, we're going to sing a song, and we sang it a few weeks ago, and I did little actions with you, and uh, you'll we'll probably remember this. I met Jesus at the crossroads where the two ways meet. Satan, he was standing there, and he said, come this way. Lots and lots of pleasures. And we go a little, that's not lots and lots, that's just small, isn't it? Okay, so Satan offers you only little things and things that don't last, whereas Jesus is standing here, and he gives us a whole new life. So we're going to sing that one. Lord Jesus, thank you for the option that you give us to follow you and not to follow Satan. Help the boys and girls to understand that. Help all of us, mummies and daddies and grannies and grandas as well, 
to put our trust in Jesus and follow him. Bless the boys and girls as they go out now to children's church and those who are going to teach them and care for them. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's join together in our prayers as we uh, pray for others. Our president this year, uh, the Reverend David Turtle, um, before he was a, a minister, uh, he was a farmer. Uh, when I was a minister in Dungannon, uh, he was in the congregation there, and he uh, milked cows and did other kind of farming things. Uh, and uh, so he has an, an interest in this. And the uh, president of the Ulster Farmers Union uh, at the moment, I think they do this serve as a, a few years as, as, as president, uh, is a man called David Brown, who's also a Methodist, and uh, I know David as well. Uh, he's uh, in the congregation in, in, in the Skillen, in Fermanagh. He belongs to a little church at, at Florence Court, and I was uh, there before I went into Edge Hill, and uh, he was um, a youngster like me at that time. And uh, there they have been, um, some of you might have seen this in the, in the press just the last day or two, and in fact I just um, cut and pasted a little bit from the BBC's news website uh, where David Brown had said, we are well used to coping with wet weather, but the present situation is beyond anything that could have been planned for. The rain is relentless and frustration is now giving way to despair as the realities of potentially bad grazing season and harvest come on top of concerns about prices not covering the cost of production. And then it references uh, some churches and mentions the Methodist Church in Ireland have issued a call amid severe disruption to the spring uh, to bring uh, prayers for the people. So David uh, Turtle um, has asked us to pray for that. We'll do that. And we have a number of uh, farmers in the congregation. And um, I did ask one before the service started what the situation was for him. And uh, it's basically kind of on the edge. The forecast is good for the week ahead, or, uh, so we pray for good weather that farmers can um, um, plant and um, put their animals out and so on. Uh, there's another Methodist I saw on the news last week, um, um, Angus Wilson. Uh, he's uh, the managing director of Wilson Potatoes. And he was also just um, highlighting the fact that it's difficult for them. Uh, so the price of your chips come the summertime and uh, they, they might go up uh, with the price of potatoes. So um, let's pray for those. And then there are a number of situations that you will perhaps know about in our church family, people who are ill, and uh, we pray for God's healing for them. Gracious God, we do come as people of God in a rural area here, and Lord, we are concerned for our, our neighbors who are farmers and who are facing difficulties uh, with the weather. We know that the weather um, comes and goes and um, and there are um, wet seasons, and sometimes one wet season comes upon another, and that does create um, some difficulties uh, for farmers. We know that other stresses and strains have come upon the farming community, and we recognize too, Lord, the, 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 um, the psychological and emotional strain that some are under. Um, and we thank you for those who have reached out to them and those who provide um, help and support uh, to those in our rural communities. And Lord, we pray that the weather might dry up um, and that we might have a, a week or two of good weather that will just change the scenario quite um, quickly and enable the farmers to do the work that they need to do. We pray too, Lord, that uh, they will be able to um, provide um, sufficiently for their, for their families. And though, um, as somebody, um, something I read the other day about um, reference to the farmers in the south, um, and somebody observed that it's only about 3% of the population are farmers, uh, but the food that they produce feeds 100% of the population. And so Lord, we thank you for the work that farmers do, and long hours, hard work, uh, work perhaps that a uh, few of us would want um, to do, but we pray that you will bless them in their work, and help the Lord, particularly in this spring season when we've had such uh, a long spell of wet weather. Um, that they will be able to, um, to do their work and that you will bless them and thank you, Lord, for them and for their families 
uh, and for the hardworking uh, communities that uh, they represent. Thank you, Lord, for David uh, Brown, who is the president of the Ulster Farmers Union. Thank you, Lord, that he brings a spiritual dimension even to that work. Thank you for David Turtle, our president, who also has a, an understanding, perhaps more than most of us do as ministers, of the pressures that uh, the farming community are under. And then, Lord, we pray too for our own church community, and we're aware of a number of people um, in our congregation and in our uh, circle of family and friends uh, who have, uh, facing, are facing um, difficulties with their health at this point in time. Some undergoing treatment, um, others still uh, waiting for further results and tests. Um, some doing quite well, others not quite so clear just what the prognosis is. And Lord, just in this quiet moment, uh, each of us brings to you some of those people for whom we are concerned and would now want to pray. And so, our Father, will you hear and answer all our prayers for Jesus' sake? Amen. And now we bring our offering to God for his work and glory. Lord, bless these gifts that we bring, and with them our worship and our service, and may they be used together for your honor and glory, in Jesus' name. Amen. Sing uh, together, Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father.
Well, now, over the last few weeks, um, Heather hasn't been the only one who's made a comment uh, like uh, the one she made before she began to read, uh, saying that she's found uh, Leviticus a bit difficult. Uh, quite a few folks um, have said something um, similar. Having said that, uh, as we've gone uh, through it over the last uh, few weeks, there have also been quite a few folks who have said, oh, that was interesting. Um, when we've explained some bits or uh, preached some bits of it or uh, the Wednesdays and discussed it together. Uh, I don't think it's wrong necessarily to have favorite parts of the Bible. I'm sure we all have favorite chapters or verses. Um, if I was to ask you what your favorite psalm is, I'm sure um, some of you would um, pick uh, various well-known um, psalms. And then other psalms you probably wouldn't even think of reading. Um, uh, but all of God's Word is inspired. And Paul tells young Timothy that all of it is profitable. Just means that sometimes you've got to work a little bit harder to get the profit um, out of it. Some things sit there on the surface, and like John 3, 16, it's just, you just read it, and instantly something blesses you from it. Other things, though, uh, take a little bit of work, a little bit of thinking, and maybe for someone else to come and help you to expound it, to explain it, to teach it. And there's no harm in, in that. Um, sometimes uh, the things that you work a little bit harder for are all the more valuable and appreciated once you get uh, to uh, the heart of it. Um, so, um, I'm kind of glad, too, that we're finishing Leviticus. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I prefer numbers, uh, but there is a great deal still, I think, of, of value. And I want this morning uh, to pick up just something fairly simple from these appointed festivals. There were seven of them. Now, I made a little handout uh, that might be uh, helpful as copies uh, in the two, uh, two porches. Um, it's two things kind of that I've melded together. Uh, it's a little introduction from a series of um, lectures that David Gooding gave a long time ago, uh, that's now available online uh, at Myrtlefield House, and I, I've printed off its page uh, three and four, and there's about 40 pages of this if you want to look it up for yourself and, and, and read it. Uh, but it very helpfully lays out in like a little table the seven uh, festivals or the seven feasts. Uh, and then I put in my own handwriting, uh, you'll see down the side of it when you pick a copy up, uh, the seven words that I'm going to use that largely come uh, from Derek Tidball's um, um, commentary on Leviticus, and uh, there'll be the seven little ideas that I'll um, share with you this morning. The uh, festivals, there are um, seven of them. There are a couple of other festivals in the Old Testament as well, and you'll see a little note about them, Purim and the Festival of Dedication, uh, which come later in Israel's history and are noticed, um, observed uh, to this day in Judaism uh, and are referenced in the, in the New Testament. But these seven that are given in the book of Leviticus, chapter 23, they kind of form three groups. Uh, they pair up Passover and unleavened bread take place in the first month, the 14th and the 15th day. They kind of link together. And then first fruits and Pentecost, uh, or sometimes called uh, the Festival of Weeks, uh, Weeks Pentecost. Uh, the first fruits was um, uh, when uh, the first harvest came and, and something was offered to God, um, an acknowledgement of um, the gift that God had had, had given, and then they counted um, seven weeks. Uh, so seven, seven is 49, uh, and then the next day was the 50th day, that's Pentecost, which is where the name Pentecost uh, in Greek um, comes from, 50 days. Um, and then in the autumn time, there in the seventh month, there were three festivals in the same month. It was probably a quieter month in terms of the agricultural activities, and the trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Festival of Booths, or Tabernacles, uh, they form a, 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 a set. So uh, that little sheet is on the foyers if you want to pick one up and uh, read through it. It might help you to put it, get it clear in your mind. Chapter 23 begins... Uh, in verse 3, well, it begins verse 1, but uh, verse 3, uh, we have this reference to the Sabbath. Uh, there are six days when you may work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath rest, a day of sacred assembly. You're not to work 
Wherever you live, it is a Sabbath to the Lord. So these festivals were given to God, given by God to Moses in the wilderness as they traveled towards the promised land with the intention that when they got there, that this would be their pattern and rhythm of life. And the first rhythm was a weekly rhythm. There was a day in the week, the seventh day, the Sabbath day, which was a day of rest. Now, there are lots of lessons, and I'm only going to draw out one or two. There are lots of lessons in the Sabbath, and I think I preached the Ten Commandments, and we said a few things about that at that stage when we came to the Fourth um, Commandment, which, of course, it was about the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And the slight interesting difference between it's, a, it's, it's the reason for keeping it uh, in Exodus and in Deuteronomy, where the Ten Commandments are uh, repeated, one to do with creation and one to do with redemption. Um, the first thing I'm just going to mention briefly, because I'm going to say a bit more about this this evening. This evening I'm going to take chapter 25 and draw out one or two lessons from the year of Jubilee. Um, one of the uh, fundamental lessons that God is trying to teach his people in having a day of rest, and then the Jubilee is a grand thing, same idea on a grander scale, is that God is against slavery. And I'll re- reference this a bit more tonight. Um, but sometimes people read through Exodus, Leviticus, and um, parts of other parts of the Old Testament. Also some New Testament passages as well, by the way. And they misunderstand it thinking that God approves of slavery. Uh, God does not approve of slavery. God has made each of us as human beings in his image. We have grace and dignity and worth because of who we are, because we're made in the image of God, and have intrinsic value. God does not intend anyone to be enslaved. Uh, Slavery has become a reality in our world because of our fallen human nature. Because some people fall into debt, because some people are greedy, because some people kidnap other people and enslave them. God consistently is against that throughout Old and New Testament. The fact that the Bible in various places uh, provide some regulation or some mitigation for how slaves or servants or workers, what, what have you, uh, should be treated, does not imply or mean that God approves of oppression and slavery. Um, a good illustration, I think, is uh, in the New Testament. You see Jesus having a debate with the scribes and the Pharisees uh, in Matthew 19 about divorce. And uh, they, the, the, the Jewish theologians at the time, were having a debate about, about divorce. You know, what, what, what ground could there be? I mean, if you just didn't fancy your wife anymore, if you could just get rid of her. Um, that's what some people thought. I thought, well, no, there's got to be something more than that. And so there was a debate about this. And then they asked Jesus about this question. And Jesus answered them, saying two things. One, God's intention is that one man should leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, and the two become one flesh. God's pattern from the beginning was that marriage is between one man and one woman for life. That's his intention. The fact is that because we are fallen human beings, sometimes relationships break down. And so Moses did introduce some regulations about how to manage those difficult and dangerous and unfortunate situations. So the least harm might come out of them. But that's not to say that God approved of divorce. The fact that he gave some regulation to mitigate the harmful impact of it does not mean that he approved of it. And the same principle applies to this question of slavery. The second thing to draw from this very briefly is that the Sabbath day uh, was a day, yes, of rest, because God's not in favor of of slavery and drudgery. and, And yes, we work. Our work is important. But that's not the only reason we get up in the morning. God intends for us to have a relationship with one another, to live in community, and to have a relationship with him. And that's what it says uh, in that verse. Six days you shall work. The seventh day is a Sabbath rest, a day of sacred assembly. In other words, it was a day when people could gather to worship God, to be in community. That's what we're doing now. Now, we're not doing it on the Sabbath day and the seventh day. Uh, the tradition is uh, developed to, for us as Christians. We meet on the first day of the week. 
because, as we sang in our opening song, uh, this is the day that he rose again. And it's a very appropriate day for us as Christians to meet. There's some overlap with the principle of Sabbath. It's a day of rest. Now, some people have to work. If you're a farmer, you've had to milk your cows and feed your animals this morning. Uh, if you're a nurse or a doctor or something, maybe you'll be on duty later on. Or, and some people are not here this morning who would be otherwise, but because they are doing that kind of essential work. But for most of us, it is a day off. It's a day of rest. And we need that physically. That's important. But it's a day of sacred assembly. It's a day when we can gather together to worship God, to be together, to encourage one another. I know that um, there'll be some folks watching. Uh, hopefully the sound is working. We had a little hiccup at the beginning because the, something um, wasn't quite working with the sound. So apologies to those uh, watching online at the moment from home. Um, and if you can't get out and you're watching uh, the service online, I hope it's a blessing to you. Uh, but as I've said sometimes cheekily, and I, well, tongue in cheek, but I mean it really, uh, if you're watching from home uh, in your jammies with a cup of coffee and you could be here and worship with us, you are missing out on something. And you're also robbing us of something. Because when we come to worship, it's not just about me. It's not just about what I get out of it. It's about what I, as a part of the family of God, contribute to the fellowship. It might be just something simple, like lifting your voice and singing praise to God. But it's about being together and having a conversation with one another before and after uh, not during the sermon, uh, but, but, but afterwards, um, a, a, and, and sharing what has been a blessing to us, and maybe finding a conversation with uh, uh, someone in the congregation. Now, they might be a friend of yours. You might meet them during the week and so on. Uh, but when you meet on the Lord's Day, when you meet here in worship, share with someone some blessing that God has given you in this week past. There was something that you were worried about, something that you were anxious about, and, and, and God gave you an answer to whatever it was. Bless someone else in this congregation by sharing that with them. Right, my time's half gone and I'm not started yet. Um, but I'm going to rattle through very quickly. The, the seven feasts uh, of the Lord. And I really have just got one word for, for, for each of them. I'm going to expand on a couple just very briefly. Uh, the first one was the Passover. We, we've preached Passover before and we often uh, refer to the Passover. Uh, God delivers. Uh, that's the key. The festival of Passover was to remind them that they were slaves in Egypt and God set them free. And for us as Christians, there are the, the same principles that were true for the Israelites back in those days uh, uh, apply to us now as, as believers. Uh, th th these are still helpful pictures for us to learn from. Um, God has delivered us from slavery in Egypt. The prince of this world, like Pharaoh, held us in his grip. And God has set us free. At great cost to himself, Jesus himself was the Passover lamb whose blood atones for our sins and sets us free. We are no longer slaves. Then the uh, Feast of Unleavened Bread. And um, God nourishes us. The reason for the unleavened bread was, in the first instance, that it was eaten in haste. They left Egypt suddenly. The destroying angel came through, and the next morning, uh, Pharaoh said, get out. And they got up, and they left. And they carried their unleavened dough on their backs, and uh, it nourished them as they went out into the wilderness. Uh, later on, of course, uh, the image of, of the yeast became to mean something additional. Uh, yeast was what brought corruption. And so for Jews today who observe the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread... Uh, they get the little children to run around the house and make sure they get all the yeast and they, they clear it out. Uh, and it's a useful picture. It's one that Paul picks up when uh, he references this in, in uh, 1 Corinthians. Get rid of the yeast of uh, the world. Be committed to God. Um, uh, Tidball has a, has a nice little um, paragraph uh, related to this. I thought I'd read this. It's uh, very helpful. He said, Christians have no equivalent to this festival, this is the one of um, unleavened bread. But it serves as a reminder of at least four important oughts for the Christian life. First, Christians ought to be in haste to obey God's will. Secondly, Christians ought to be pilgrim people 
always making spiritual progress and never settling into a state of smug spiritual complacency. Thirdly, Christians ought to regularly examine their lives and throw out the corrupting influences of sin. And finally, Christians ought to feast themselves on the nutritious food of truth instead of the seductive junk food of compromise that is often that it is often mistaken for. Uh, that's a helpful paragraph. The festival of first fruits, then, is the next one uh, that is linked together with Pentecost or the festival of weeks. Um, the idea here was that at the start of the harvest, something was, was waved to God. It was a sign of saying, uh, um, Thank you for this, Lord. Uh, this, is the, this is the promise of a harvest to come. And uh, it's a, an idea that is uh, picked up in, in the New Testament in uh, 1 Corinthians uh, uh, 15, verse 20. Um, Paul says, But Christ indeed has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And a similar thing in Romans 8. Uh, the first fruits. In other words, Jesus rise, r- rose from the dead as a guarantee that a greater resurrection is coming. He's the first fruits. So when they had the festival of first fruits, it was an acknowledgement that, oh yes, the, 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 the grain has sprouted. Um, we're going to have a harvest. It's not going to be for a while yet, but it's coming. And Christ is, uh, his resurrection is the first fruits, the guarantee of what is uh, to come. And then what comes uh, uh, 50 days on, uh, Pentecost, uh, the theme or the, the key word, uh, God provides. And God did provide a harvest. And the festival of Pentecost uh, has a number of uh, significant lessons for us. First of all, it's a picture about harvest, and sometimes we celebrate that uh, ourselves, of course, in, in our own harvest services. It was also, uh, uh, became in, in Jewish tradition, it became um, synonymous with the giving of the law at Sinai, that God provided the moral framework for which the community should live. God provides instruction for us, food for us, instruction for us. And then, of course, Pentecost for us as Christians, we have a wonderful extra dimension to it that perhaps the Jews didn't see. Um, He gives us his Holy Spirit. God provides the mechanisms, the means, the power by which we can keep the law and we can enjoy what God has given to us, God's Holy Spirit. Interesting little detail in the story that, that I can't resist um, mentioning just in passing. Uh, we're told that um, Moses gave the instruction that they were to make two loaves. And uh, this was an important part of the, of, the, of, the, of the festival, the two loaves. Why two loaves? Well, if you read Ephesians chapter 2, you will get the answer. Uh, Paul explains that there are two loaves. There are two groups of people. There are those who were God's chosen people, Israel, the descendants of Abraham. And then there are the Gentiles, basically everybody else. (laughs) Jews and Gentiles. And God's plan had always been to choose the Jews for a particular purpose. And that purpose then worked through until Christ came. And then Christ sent his disciples out to all of the nations to proclaim the gospel. Two loaves. And the two loaves have become one And that's the great significance, or one of the great significant things about Pentecost. And the tongues that the disciples spoke uh, wasn't just so much a miracle of blessing for them, though that may have been the case. It was to communicate to the whole nations, to all of the nations, the truth of the gospel. And then just also another little incidental in that uh, little section. There's a little couple of verses that talk about um, gleanings. Little uh, When you're harvesting, he says, um, God says, uh, don't go to the very edge of the field. And when you drop a few bits, don't go back and pick them up again. Leave them for the poor, for the stranger, for the alien. And God's concern for those who are struggling to survive is built in. And that's a principle for us today still. Uh, and then, again, quite briefly, the, the, the remaining three. Trumpets. God remembers. Uh, We don't have a particular equivalent in uh, our Christian understanding, I think, of this, although you can pick up some verses in Revelation about trumpets and so on, where God announces something. That was kind of the idea. And then we have the uh, whole uh, 
uh, significant, perhaps the most significant festival of all, uh, which was the festival of the Day of Atonement. And we, we, we explained some of that a, a week or two ago, so I'll not go over that ground again. But God forgives. God deals with our sins. It was a rather elaborate um, ceremony with all kinds of bits and pieces to it. But the heart of it was that God was able to welcome his people into his presence, sinful though they were. And God welcomes us. He forgives us. And we are a community of people who can live together in the presence of God, the Holy One, because atonement has been made. And then finally, the festival of tents or tabernacles or booths is sometimes called. And the key word uh, that I picked up here is that that God um, reminds us of something important. Uh, Trumpets, he he remembers. Uh, Tabernacles, he reminds us of something that is important. The idea was, you see, that uh, for this week, it must have been very exciting for the kids, and I imagine the little ones look forward to that. Daddy, daddy. Uh, how many weeks before tabernacles? Because we love tabernacles. It's, it's, it's the most exciting of the, uh, you know, uh, we, 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 we live in a tent. We go outside, we live in a tent for a week. I mean, when you're six or seven, that's really exciting. Uh, when you're 67, it's maybe just not quite so um, exciting. But nonetheless, uh, the idea was, uh, and uh, they, they lived outside. And it was to remind them of their wandering through the wilderness and to remind them that they were a pilgrim people, that they were on a journey, and that they hadn't yet arrived. That's something that you and I need to bear in mind. We haven't yet arrived. You say sometimes, well, why, why am I facing all these struggles? Um, I had a man one time who um, asked me a very hard question. Uh, his lovely little daughter was quite ill. And I was standing praying for the wee girl in her bed in the hospital. And he looked me in the eye and he said, David, he said, what's all this about my yoke is easy and my burden is light? It was tough for him and his wife and this little one that they cherished so much. Now she did okay and she, God brought them through it. But just in the midst of that, It was a real struggle for him. And I don't know what struggles you are facing now or what struggles you will face in the days ahead, but I can virtually guarantee that you will face some kind of difficulties and struggles. And you might say, where is God in the midst of this? Well, just remember this. It's not over yet. You are still living in a tent The time will come when all things will be made new. There'll be a new heaven and a new earth. And you will be home. There's a wonderful story uh, I heard years ago, and I I did try, I had a quick little Google for it, but I couldn't find the the, the exact details about this, or not that it really matters. But the the gist of it is this, that uh, a a big ship came sailing into New York, and there was some very important celebrity on the boat and they were welcoming this person home. And there was the band, and there was the ticker tape, and there were flags, and there was a great celebration as this important person was welcomed back uh, to New York. And then there was another couple standing on the side of the ship. Uh, They'd also arrived back to New York, and they'd spent many decades serving the Lord as missionaries in the back of beyond somewhere. And the man was a bit downhearted, and he saw all the celebration of this celebrity, and and, and he kind of wistfully said to himself and said to his wife, well, there's not many people to welcome us. To which the wife very wisely, uh, gentlemen, sometimes our wives are much wiser than we are. She smiled at him, and she said, dear, We're not home yet. We're not home yet. Remember that we are still pilgrim people. 
and we will face struggles and difficulties. God has given us a rhythm for life and uh, great uh, resources. Uh, He delivers us, he nourishes us, he provides for us, he remembers us, he forgives us. But also, he reminds us that we're not home yet. Amen. And we'll sing in closing, only by grace can we enter. And let's share that grace together and bless one another. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.